One of the best ways to learn something new mathematically is to convince yourself that it's just something that you already knew wearing a different disguise. In this video, I want to take a look at the first isomorphism theorem, which is the main result we're trying to build toward in this chapter's worth of material, but I want to look at it in a guise that we may have already seen it before, back in linear algebra. So in what sense in linear algebra can we find within a linear transformation living a little invertible linear transformation that gives us information about how to go both back and forth between two vector spaces. So remember, linear algebra is not really about matrices. <laughs> linear algebra is about vector spaces and linear transformations between those vector spaces. Sometimes we can use a matrix to represent those linear transformations, but it's really the transformations we're trying to study most of the time and not the matrices themselves. So suppose I have two vector spaces V and W and I have a linear transformation T that goes from V to W. I'm going to make a sketch here of a specific linear transformation. Let's take the linear transformation from three-dimensional Euclidean space to three-dimensional Euclidean space that's defined via multiplication by this matrix, this three by three matrix. So if you give me a point in R3, I will put its coordinates into this column vector, I'll multiply the column vector by this matrix on the left, and that will produce for me uh, at the target image over here on the right. So if you give me 1, 1, 1, I'll put 1, 1, 1 in this column, multiply by this matrix, and I get the result 0, 4, 4. So there's one example of what this linear transformation does to just one point, 1, 1, 1, inside of the domain of this linear transformation. All right, so what happens to other points? What we want to do is get an understanding of the entirety of how this linear transformation is acting on its domain vector space, and what, if anything, that action can tell us about the structure of that domain. So that's a tall order. Let us start by looking at the image of another point, 2, 2, 0. And if you check what 2, 2, 0 does in this linear transformation, if I put that in this column vector I multiplied by this matrix, it turns out that 2, 2, 0 has the same image, 0, 4, 4, as 1, 1, 1 did. So what I have here is a function which is not 1 to 1 because I have two different elements of the domain which have the same image in the range. And that in itself is already telling us something interesting that's going on here. It doesn't happen with every linear transformation. Here's another point, 0, 0, 2, that also has the same image in the range as 1, 1, 1 does and 2, 2, 0. So all three of these points in R3 all have the same image in the range over on the right. So of course, whenever something like this happens, we observe as mathematicians that it's probably not an accident. Right? There's probably a reason why this linear transformation is not seeing the difference between these three different elements of the domain. That the difference between these three points in the domain is getting lost when we apply this linear transformation. Why might that be? Well, if you think about what the differences between these three points look like, all those differences are going to be vectors that lie along this purple line right here that goes through these three points. And you can check that as soon as I know that two of these points have the same image under a linear transformation, every point on the line segment in between them will also have the same image as they do under this linear transformation. And so we're going to get not just three points that all have the same image, but an entire line's worth of points, at least, that all have the same image, 0, 4, 4, under this linear transformation. Now, why do they all have the same image? Well, let's take a look at an example of a vector which lies within this purple line. The vector 1, 1, negative 1. Think of that as a direction vector, the difference. It's what I would get if I took 2, 2, 0, and I subtracted 1, 1, 1. So when I use the word difference, I'm doing so intentionally here. If I subtract 2, 2, 0, minus 1, 1, 1, I get a vector 1, 1, minus 1. And what happens to that vector under this linear transformation? Thought of as a vector with its uh, original point at the origin. 1, 1, minus 1, if I put that into my column vector here, that lands on 0, 0, 0, the 0 vector in the range. And that would appear to be an important clue. Because if my linear transformation is sending this vector to the zero vector. Then because my linear transformation is a linear transformation and not just any old function, it respects the structure in this vector space. It respects scalar multiplication. So any scalar multiple of this vector will get sent to a scalar multiple of its image, but every scalar multiple of its image is zero, zero, zero. Therefore, any scalar multiple of this vector will also get sent to zero. 
And also, any sum of this vector with any other vector that gets sent to zero will also get sent to zero, because t is a linear transformation. So it respects scalar multiplication and also addition. And so that is a key observation, that the reason that all of these points had the same image is that all of these points had the same image, and that image was the zero vector. And so we attach names in linear algebra to the phenomena that we see here. All of these red points had the same image because their differences have an image of zero. And the set of everything in linear algebra which has an image of zero is called the kernel of that linear transformation. Or it's sometimes called the null set or the null space of that linear transformation. Particularly when we're thinking about matrix theory, it usually gets called null space instead of kernel. But it means the same thing. It's everything whose image is zero. And because its image is zero, those are the differences between any other points in the domain that are getting lost when this linear transformation does its thing. So that's the first key observation, is that the kernel, the stuff that gets sent to zero in a linear transformation, plays an important role in telling me about the properties of that transformation. Can it also tell us about the structure of the vector space in which it resides? That's where we want to go next. So here's the next observation. If we could somehow forget about the fact that all the infinitely many points along this kernel all have the same image, which makes this function definitely very much not one-to-one, -one. if I could forget about the lack of one-to-oneness that happens because the kernel is getting squished to zero, will I get a one-to-one -one function? And in linear algebra, the astonishing answer is yes, that the only source of non-one-to-oneness in a linear transformation comes from the existence of the kernel, that set of stuff that's getting sent to the zero vector. And so besides the kernel, if it were not for the kernel, this would be a one-to-one -one and onto its image, therefore, linear transformation. And so in linear algebra, what we can do is we can say, well, the kernel makes up, in this example, it looks like one dimension of the domain. If I can take the other two orthogonal dimensions to the kernel, then this linear transformation is going to carry that two-dimensional vector space in an invertible fashion onto a two-dimensional subspace of the target vector space over here. And the idea is that then the correspondence between this green subspace in the domain and this green subspace in the range, that correspondence that's induced by this linear transformation is not only one-to-one, -one, it's also onto and is therefore an invertible linear transformation. So even though my whole linear transformation was not invertible because it wasn't one-to-one, -one, within the domain I can find a subspace, it turns out, on which this does become an invertible linear transformation. This often goes in linear algebra by the name of the rank plus nullity theorem. And it's very underrated, I think, when you learn it the first time, theorem about linear algebra. One of the ways that you use it is to do things like prove that the rank of, the, of a matrix by its columns is equal to the rank of a matrix by its rows. Well, that's just a statement that the dimension of this green plane and this green plane over here are equal to one another. Um, but in a linear algebra class, I don't know if we always do it justice to just how profound and how valuable a theorem of this nature is in illuminating the structure of a vector space. Because now it says not only does the kernel of this linear transformation get sent to zero, but the column space, which is what we call the image of our linear transformation in linear algebra, and the orthogonal complement of the kernel, which we call the row space, that's the span of all the rows of the matrix in linear algebra, that a linear transformation T carries its row space in an isomorphic, invertible fashion onto its column space. So if you like, there's an invertible two by two matrix that would describe the linear transformation's action from this row space onto this column space. And that transformation is invertible. So why should we expect this thing to be true? What were the theoretical firmaments on which this rank plus nullity theorem relied in linear algebra? Well, let's think about it for a second. If you give me any point in the domain, so any point in the copy of R3 over here, then I can write that point as the sum of some element from the row space plus some element from the kernel of my linear transformation. So this x I'm going to write as k from the kernel plus r from the row space. And because kernel and row space turn out to be orthogonal, 
uh, we know that that uh, is definitely going to be a unique uh, expression. Uh, it's definitely going to be because of the linear independence. There's only one way to write that element as something from the kernel plus something from the row space. But then what does that allow me to do? It allows me to say what is the image of this transformation uh, of this point x. Because when t, the linear transformation, acts on the sum, it's going to act separately on the element from the kernel and the element from the row space, and the element from the kernel is going to get sent to zero. So all in all, what t lets us do is two important things. First, it lets us deconstruct the domain of my linear transformation into an orthogonal, what we would actually call a direct sum of vector spaces. We can see the vector space v, which is the domain of my transformation, as the direct sum of the kernel, that stuff which is getting sent to the zero vector by this linear transformation, with the row space, which is the orthogonal complement of the kernel. It's the everything else besides the kernel, if you like. It's the stuff, it's the subspace of things which is orthogonal to that which is getting sent to zero. And every element in the domain can be accounted for as an orthogonal sum of something from the kernel plus something from the row space. And that's the first important thing that a linear transformation lets me do. Decompose the domain into a direct sum of kernel plus row space. And the second important thing is that we're also going to be, under, be able to understand both of those pieces, the kernel and the row space, up to isomorphism because of the invertibility of the transformation from the row space to the column space. In other words, if I want to understand what this row space is back here, I can equally understand what the column space, the image of this transformation, looks like over here in the range vector space. Because those two are in one-to-one -one correspondence, in fact, an invertible linear transformation between the two of them, then as a vector space in its own right, the row space and the column space are pretty much the same as one another. And this is the frame with which we want to approach the similar questions about group theory. If I want to understand the properties of a group, and I have a structure-preserving function out of that group, then by using the analog theorem, which is called the first isomorphism theorem, we're going to be able to say, if I can understand the kernel well enough, and if I can understand the image well enough, then everything which is left over when I take the kernel away is going to be isomorphic to that image. And that lets me understand what turns out, in some cases, to be a large and somehow very complicated piece of my group by understanding instead its image over here on the right side.